Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your genes. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, Patrick Wang launches Space Ops Australia. But first up, is the news about reversing ageing in fish and flies. <laughs> Fish Gut Rejuvenation Researchers at the Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging in Cologne, Germany showed that middle-aged killifish fed gut bacteria from young killifish lived 41% longer and were more active. Turquoise killifish reach sexual maturity at three weeks old and die after a few months. The turquoise killifish lives in temporary ponds that form during rainy seasons in Mozambique and Zimbabwe. As we age, humans and mice tend to lose some of the diversity in our microbiomes, developing a more uniform community of gut microbes, with unhealthy species rising to take over when we're elderly. The same loss of gut microbe diversity happens to killifish. The team first treated the middle-aged fish with antibiotics to clear out their gut flora, as would happen in faecal transplant therapy for humans. Next... For 12 hours, the researchers placed the treated middle-aged fish in a sterilised aquarium containing the gut contents of young fish. The middle-aged killifish probed and bit at the gut contents to see whether it was food which caused them to ingest the microbes, even though they didn't actually eat the young fish gut contents. The researchers found that the transplanted microbes successfully recolonised the guts of the middle-aged killifish that had been in the tank with them. At the advanced age of 16 weeks old, the gut microbiomes of fish that had received young microbes still resembled those of six-week-old fish. The treated killifish darted around their tanks more frequently than other elderly fish, with activity levels more like six-week-old fish. By contrast, gut microbes from older fish had no effect on the lifespans of younger fish. The treated fish's median lifespans were 41% longer than fish exposed to microbes from middle-aged animals, and 30% longer than fish that received no treatment. Antibiotics alone also lengthened the fish's lifespan, but to a lesser extent. Why does it work? Researchers guess that maybe the immune system wears out with age, allowing harmful microbes to crowd out healthy ones. Or, perhaps the young microbes are directly helping the immune system. Or, the microbes turn from helpful to nasty when they sense that their host's life hasn't got much longer to go, as a way of maximising their own survival. The researchers hope that their work will provide a key to slowing the onset of age-associated diseases in humans by specifically targeting the gut microbiome. At the Buck Institute for Research on Aging in Novato, California, Researchers are swapping the gut microbes of fruit flies to see if there's an effect on ageing. And at Dalhousie University in Halifax, researchers are swapping the gut microbes of old and young mice. Perhaps someday we'll freeze a sample of our own gut bacteria when we're young and healthy to have transplanted when we're middle-aged. Transplants of faeces from healthy humans to people with Clostridium difficile infections has been thoroughly proved effective over decades of research but the ick factor has stopped it being widely experimented with. However, maybe the American service that offers to transfuse young blood into your body for a large fee will add young poo transplants to their list of experimental rejuvenating services. Professor Thomas Barodi at the Centre for Digestive Diseases in Sydney, who has been pioneering faecal transplants for decades, has been working on a special kind of microbiome capsule that you could swallow that would survive the stomach acids that kill most microbes, 
and plant an optimised selection of healthy gut microbes right where they're needed. The team's findings were posted to the biorxiv.org preprint server by Dorayo Valenzano, a geneticist at the Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging in Cologne, and was titled Regulation of Lifespan by the Gut Microbiota in the Short-Lived African Turquoise Killifish. Big Power Makes Flies Age A team at the University of California, Los Angeles, has improved the health of aged fruit flies and slowed their aging by targeting faulty mitochondria in their cells. Mitochondria are organelles that convert food from your blood into adenosine triphosphate, ATP, that our cells need for energy. Mitochondria have their own genome, separate to that in our cell's DNA, and they replicate separately to our cells, even while they live inside our cells. Mitochondria started the revolution as independent microbes that got into our cells and became mutually helping symbionts, providing energy, instead of infecting us or getting eaten. Mitochondria often become damaged with age, and as people grow older, those damaged mitochondria tend to accumulate in the brain, muscles and other organs. If the damaged mitochondria aren't eliminated, then they can contribute to a wide range of age-related diseases. The UCLA researchers found that as fruit flies reach middle age, one month into their two-month lifespan, their mitochondria change from their original small round shape into larger oval shapes. These larger shapes make them harder to eliminate, so they accumulate. In flies and mice, levels of the protein DRP1 decline with age. The scientists treated middle-aged one-month-old flies with DRP1 protein to remove the damaged mitochondria by breaking up enlarged mitochondria into smaller pieces. Only healthy small round mitochondria were left. The treated flies became more active and more energetic and had more endurance. Following the treatment, female flies lived 20% longer, while males lived 12% longer, on average. Seven days of treatment was enough to effectively rejuvenate the flies and give them stronger muscles. Fruit flies suffer from leaky intestines as a disease of old age, as do worms, mice and monkeys. The researchers found that this disease was delayed after the flies were treated with the DRP1 protein. The researchers hoped to find a way to mimic the action of DRP1 in a drug that humans could take to add extra healthy years to our lives. In the next experiment, the researchers turned off the ATG1 gene, rendering the fly cells unable to eliminate the damaged mitochondria. The result was that giving the flies DRP1 didn't help them. While DRP1 breaks up in large mitochondria, the ATG1 gene is needed to dispose of the damaged ones. In the final experiment, the researchers turned off a protein in middle-aged fruit flies called MFN, that enables mitochondria to fuse together into larger pieces. This treatment also extended the flies' lives and improved their health. You can either break up the mitochondria with DRP1 or prevent them from fusing by inactivating MFN. Both have the same effect of making the mitochondria smaller, which gives the flies an extended and healthier lifespan. The paper was published in the journal Nature Communications and was titled Promoting DRP1-mediated mitochondrial fission in midlife prolongs healthy lifespan of Drosophila melangasta. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Next up, rocket science. Patrick Wang is one of five co-founders and CEO for Space Ops Australia, a local launch company designing and building rockets to launch small satellites. I spoke to Patrick at an Orbit Oz Space Entrepreneur Meetup and began by asking him, why build small rockets instead of very large ones like everyone else? So over the recent years, the satellite market has been constant and the 
satellites traditionally have been, as you say, very large. But what we've seen now in the last 10 years, in fact, the the onset and creation of these new smaller satellites, um, they're 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters cube at base level, but they build up to one unit, two unit, three unit. Um, they're very, being small, they're light weight as well. They're also very cheap to manufacture. And what was once an education or university type thing in the last three years, it's become a real commercial asset. And it is one of the few sectors within space that has seen significant growth. That's why there's a put now a new push to go smaller. At the moment, CubeSats would be sent up on the really big rockets, but in massive groups. So they only pay a fraction of the cost because they're sharing it. Isn't that cheaper than sending up a little rocket with just a few? So it's really about what kind of things you want and what your needs are as a, as a, if you're building these small satellites. You know, so. One of the interesting things, actually, is that the price to get a small satellite onto the traditional rockets is actually increasing. There is so much demand out there now that the launch companies are seeing that they can charge just a little bit more. Now, of course, once you ride with them, you're at the mercy of the large rocket that's sitting next to you. They say when we launch. They say where we go, what altitude. And... You know, that's something you don't really get a say in. And if you have a mission-specific requirement to say, we need to be somewhere at this type of orbit, well, I'm sorry, that's not going to be their priority. So with a smaller launch vehicle, we can afford that option to these smaller satellite developers. You know, our launch times are going to be much faster. Cost-wise, we will be working very hard to make it comparatively, competitively priced if not less. So we're going to offer our customers lower cost, near on-demand access to space. And so you're going to be competing with reusable rockets from people like Elon Musk with his SpaceX. So are you going to have reusable rockets? Absolutely. It's the only real way. This is a challenge that we need to do. If we want to provide access to space for everybody, we need to solve this problem. SpaceX is on their way. They've done their first stage recovery. Once they achieve their second stage recovery, it's a whole different ball game for space. So for us in a small launch, you know, the economies of it is if we build one, throw it away, it's very expensive. So we have to build for reusability in place. And then that's how we can continue to compete with someone like SpaceX in the long game. And what's the weight of the payload that you're aiming to send up? At most, it'll be 25 kilograms. And for that 25 kilos, what sort of price are you aiming to have the rockets cost people to go up? That's an interesting way to put it. Well, I would say in terms of pricing... A lot of time, this, the pricing value is done by dollars per kilogram. So a lot of our competition is hovering around $30,000 per kilogram. Uh, SpaceX, by economies of scale, they've got that much less. We're talking like $7,000 a kilogram. So our target is to get that low, lower than 30000 per kilogram and you know lower than 20 lower than 10 and that'd be that'd be it that'd be ideal and is it a different sort of technology to what the big rockets are using to send a smaller payload into space are using different fuels different technologies or is it pretty much the same thing scaled down it's actually very similar in technology absolutely you know we it's all about a matter of energy density and just having a fuel source, at least in current times, having a fuel source that's green, you know, that's safe to handle, not deadly to anybody. So, you know, a lot of the information, it's all built on previous work of NASA and uh, Roscosmos, the Russian Space Agency, and then every other space agency. So 
you know, it's it's tried and true and tested essentially. So that's what we're using. It's stuff from the previous century. So when you say green, what do you mean? So rather than using, let's say, hydrogen peroxide, for example, incredibly toxic, we use kerosene with combined with the oxygen. So it makes it a bit more friendly to the environment. How many stages in your rocket? Our stage has two stages. Primary stage, of course, gives maximum boost, fight the gravity, and then second stage, we'll take it to orbit and do the final course corrections as well. And where would you be launching from? That's a very good question. Ideally, we'll be in northern part of Australia, so we're looking at North Queensland, the Northern Territory even. If we can get any further, then that'd be great, but we'd like to stay on the mainland, mainly because we have access to towns, industries there. It's easier to transport you know, our oxygen, for example, whatever hardware we need. You know, our vehicle's being designed to be easy, easy to transport. We can send it on road even. So, you know, not having to fight an ocean to get to somewhere, not having to handle all the nightmare of logistics of getting things to a sea platform. That's why we prefer to be on the mainland, Australia, and be as close to the equator as possible. And you want to be close to the equator for a bit of an assist? Yes, absolutely. We want the mass of the Earth to kind of throw its body weight around and, you know, give us that little bit more kick. So can you explain that for people who haven't heard of why you want to launch from an equator? So the Earth is rotating on an axis. And that rotational spin can be applied to the object once we lift off. So at the equator, the spin is the strongest. And so once we launch from there, we get that little bit of extra boost. And that makes for a much more efficient rocket. When did you start? We started at the 2017. We actually came together during the end of 2016, so that was December-ish. And yeah, it started 2017, we incorporated, and that was it. We've been at it ever since. And you've already started testing some of your motors? Yeah, so we got into a, an incubator called Incubate at the University of Sydney, and at that time we were given five grand and we figured that was the thing to do. Build an engine, get out there, just, just make it happen. Let's see some fire. So that was it. 14 weeks, we looked at all the technical documents, did some drawings, got it made, CNC machines, this and that. Found a friend with a contact out in Bathurst. We went out there, tested it. Oh, that was a long day. It's 4 a.m. to 9 p.m. We were at it. And... Yeah, at the end of the day, we got it. F we got that thing throwing fire. And when do you expect you might have your first actual flight with your rocket? Actual flight will be kind of suborbital. It'll only be a few kilometers. Uh, we expect that to be in 2018. With actual getting to space, touching space, over 100 kilometers, hopefully 2019. When your rockets return, how are they coming back? So our plan of attack is to work with a method of decelerating used on some of the Mars missions. So they call it aerobraking, braking and it's just the spacecraft skims the planet's atmosphere and uses the atmosphere to decelerate. So our vehicle is being designed to have a flying flight re-entry, so a glide re-entry system. Of course, we'll be traveling very quickly. We don't want to be burning up. So we expect to be aerobraking over some period of time. We can resist high temperatures, of course, but to an extent. So it's a careful engineering challenge to find the right path, find the right amount of time to re-enter Earth's atmosphere and then come back on autopilot essentially. So we want to fly back into somewhere. 
And I imagine it's an expensive business to start up. I mean, just merely to get the licenses to be able to launch, especially since you're not just making satellites, you're making the most dangerous and biggest part, the rocket. Is that a difficult thing for a new company? In our current environment, absolutely it is. The current rules are you need a space license and then a launch permit, two separate things. The license, the space license, gives you power to actually operate a facility, launch a vehicle. That's $400,000. And then year after year, it's like $190-something thousand dollars. It's a very high bar. It's very prohibitive for a small launch company. But it's something we hope will be changing in the near future. And it kind of aligns with our timeline, I believe. So... What we're doing is costly, yes. It, we're expecting at least five million to do the full test program. But compared to trying to build a traditional launch vehicle where you need hundreds of millions of dollars, thousands upon thousands of hours of time, you know, this is possibly one of the cheapest ways for us to get to space. Indigenously, like natively, like have our own means to reach space. I've been told that part at least of that licence fee, at least the per launch licence fee, is to go towards the government's international obligations if anything goes wrong, if something crashes into somebody's property or whatever, the government's responsible and so it goes a tiny way towards the insurance for that. I guess rockets can explode or they can drop. So what happens when they explode and drop? Are you responsible? Is the Australian government responsible as well? How does that go? So our obligations are that for sure, if something goes sideways, the company is going to be responsible. But the rules are set out in such a way that whatever the object's origin, point of origin, that nation is then responsible for it as well. So our legal obligations as it is set means we have unlimited liability which means a whole lot of money that we need in place just in case of something happens so our insurance requirements are very very high and i guess it's a good thing but you know if we're trying to start a business start a space sector in this country it's very prohibitive so we really need to be looking at alternative means how do we mitigate that risk another way Maybe it's over a long period of time. Maybe it's a cumulative type premium system. And I gather as a company that started this year, you're still looking for funding. Yes, we are still looking for funding. We do like to do our engineering, so we want to validate our tech. But most importantly, we're out there looking for customers as well. So customers are our number one priority. You know, Whatever they need, we're going to do our best to support them. So as long as we can achieve getting interest, I really believe that we can get investors to come on board and to essentially help us out. I think the time is right for us to start investing in the Australian space sector. We have in the past, but probably not enough. The space sector just by chance right now is changing and you know, we can work off a clean slate almost. And I think we can use that to our advantage. It'll it'll really, we can tailor make a space sector, a space agency that'll fit the future of space. So I think the time is right for us to commit more as as a society with government on board as well. You know, it's just they're waiting for us. Well, Patrick, thank you very much. Thank you. That was Patrick Wang, CEO of Space Ops Australia, designing and building little rockets to launch little satellites much faster and cheaper than everyone else. Find out more at spaceops.com.au. What you know, what you understand. What courses are you taking next year? I was just trying to imagine the look on Mr. Bristow's face if he thought somebody had enrolled in general science just to get ready to go to the moon. (laughs) (laughs) We are getting a little off the beam, aren't we? But only because we were talking about the moon. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. 
Would you like to hear your voice on radio? Record a voice memo on your phone or use the voicemail tab on the website. We need more people contributing stories to Diffusion. Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. And please do send me an email so I know you're listening and you'd like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Join my patrons in supporting the show at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin MacLeod of Incompetech.com. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 27 stations on the community radio network, including 2RBM in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2MBR in Numbaka Valley, and 3MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos, and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than 900 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labeled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash Diffusion Radio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick, everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography, collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.